for me to share this time with you. I'm not much into autobiography, but eight years ago, Brother Given called me, said he was looking for someone from the Church of Christ background who had a testimony of what faith had meant in their life. He was having a hard time finding someone from that background. <laughs> He was so overjoyed that he kept inviting me. And I'm so overjoyed I keep coming. Amen. This is really a highlight of Clara and I's year. Now, lest you think that we don't have much highlight, this is really what we consider to be a true joy in our lives. We've been to lots of places in the world, but uh, they'll be burned up too. But I really think we carry something home with us from this association that we can treasure forever. My assigned topic, which by the way, this was assigned. I did not choose it, but God richly blessed me through Michael. Is this not true, Michael? Did you not assign this? But you asked me to. Uh, what? But you asked me to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How soon you forget. <laughs> Confidence of a pure heart. First John, third chapter, 19th verse. By the way, I'm talking to you tonight. Amen. Are you going to separate you from your heart? Your heart's who's God dealing with. This is not a game with Him. Amen. The poets sometimes would say you, and sometimes they say your heart. They knew it's the same thing. I'm talking to you. Let's get serious. And hereby we know that we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence before God. Amen. Now let me tell you, for whatever else this means, God is serious about it. Amen. Or He even said He was greater than our hearts. I mean, that got Him serious. That got my attention. Amen. He wants me to focus on that. Now, by the way, God's always been serious about an unpure heart. Yes. And He's always been serious about you having a pure heart. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you how serious He got. He just destroyed the whole world because their hearts were continually evil. This wiped out, save for eight souls. A whole world. You don't think that's serious? God intends for me to have a pure heart. Always been serious about this. And it is true, Genesis 8th chapter after the flood, God had to make this announcement, the thoughts of man's heart was still evil. Boy, it's a sad commentary after wiping out a whole world of people that their heart was still evil. But I need to know that. Mm -hmm. I need to know that, that there's something wrong in Adam's descendants. Maybe a physician would call it a bad gene. I don't care what it is. God says... The heart of man, the descendants of Adam, is evil. Mm -hmm. Now I tell you, we had some wonderful poets and some wonderful prophets in the Bible, and they verified this thing also. They agreed with God on it. I like that. Proverbs said, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Mm -hmm. It's pretty scary. The heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah says. Mm-hmm. 
and beyond cure. Proverbs again, who can say I have made my heart clean? Who can say I am pure from myself? There's that poetry linking myself and my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, those Hebrews knew poetry. They'd say it twice using different words but meaning essentially the same thing. Who can say I have made my heart clean? That's interesting. That poet there saw what the legalist and the self-help book writers and the do-it-yourself crowd has still not seen. That's right. Amen. I mean, if all those guys learn that, the bookstores is going to be empty. Nearly. <laughs> so here was their testimony about this situation. Psalms. God is the confidence of all the ends of the earth. Psalms 118. It is better to put confidence in the Lord than man or princes. Proverbs, the Lord is my confidence. Mm -hmm. Proverbs, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. Just not confidence, but strong confidence. I'm with Sister Jen. I fear you can just replace that word with trust and faith. That's not the fear of the whip. Psalm 7, my shield is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. Now our confidence is in God, but the heart still must be upright. Amen. Now, a little diversion here to make your time worthwhile. Scripture puts a high value and honor on a pure heart. Amen. Amen. Yes. You remember what Jesus said? Of course you do. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed, for they shall see God. Amen. Oh, where's the unpure heart looking forward to? Psalms 119, the whole uh, fourth letter uh, of the Hebrew there, 25 through the 32nd verse. The psalmist is setting the heart free. That's getting it pure, by the way. We'll show that later on is a prerequisite to holding fast the commandments of God mm -hmm. and running in the path of the commandments. Now again, the psalmist in the 24th chapter says, after extolling a pure heart, he just kind of made this announcement. That man shall receive the blessings of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Mm -hmm. Now you just heard the imputation of that righteousness Amen. from the previous speaker. Hebrews, cast not away your confidence, which had great recompense or reward. Amen. Isaiah, in confidence shall be your strength. Now, okay, we have a little dilemma here, don't we? The good things go to the pure in heart, but man stuck with a bad heart. Well, that's uh, only a dilemma uh, to us that haven't gone any farther into the matter. Well, it was a dilemma, even to Jeremiah and the poets. So they had a prayer. Prayer session about this. That's not a bad idea. The psalmist said it this way, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Yes, amen. Ezekiel says, remove my stony heart. Give me a heart of flesh. Mm -hmm. God answered those prayers. Amen. God answered those prayers to Jeremiah, the one that said, the heart is deceitful above all things. God said to him, through him, I will give them a heart to know me. Amen. Jeremiah, where was that? When was that? How was that? Well, of course, that begins a saga of pure gospel. 
Now we had a brother today that recounted for us Jeremiah 31. God, you see, had had a covenant relationship with a people, the Israelites. And after that glorious covenant between God and those Israelites had been trampled underfoot, broken every way that man could possibly break that covenant, utterly. And after a substantial part of the Israelites literally turned to other gods. Can you broke that? That's just the first commandment. A people married to God and left Him. Along comes Jeremiah, kind of as the covenant attorney, to make an announcement here. This deal's over. What we're saying. The marriage is over. Write out a bill of divorcement. Hosea says, God says through Hosea, I am not your God. You are not my people. What a shock. No wonder Jeremiah wept. He had a lot to weep about. What a thing to have to announce after a dream that was almost Hard to describe, too grand to be true. But at the end of that sorrow, Jeremiah had that privilege to announce something new, something different, something more exciting. And praise God for his prophets. Now I read Jeremiah 31. 31. There was the announcement. Yes, the old covenant was in ruins. Many of the covenant people had already been shipped off to Babylon. Mm -hmm. Babylon's always slavery, you know. Amen. It's not the end, Jeremiah. I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be like that one at Sinai. Well, you do remember that one at Sinai, of course. Outward, external, tables of stone, outside, ritualistic. In the material realm, tabernacles, holy hills, holy mountains, a temple on a holy hill, a holy place. You had to go to worship. I don't like that word. And if you ever understand where we're headed tonight, you'll never use it again. I'll get to that, God willing. You had to go. You had to meet a man. He's dressed different than you, as in part of He was a priest. He directed you in your worship sacrificing and offerings, blood shed before your very eyes, the law written on tables of stone, visible appeal to the outer man. The trouble was the heart didn't like it. Not the heart they had. The heart of Adam doesn't like it. They could not handle it. All of those ceremonies surrounding the law was how I ate, how I dressed. What I could do, what I couldn't do, where I could go, where I couldn't go. All outward. And now Jeremiah says a new covenant. A new kind of covenant. Mm -hmm. It's a fresh. It'll always be fresh. Amen. I'll put my law in your mind and write it in your hearts. Not outside, Jeremiah. Inside. Go write it in your heart. But Jeremiah... Didn't you say our hearts was bad? I want to bring Ezekiel into this. Now I always thought Ezekiel got the short end of enough credit. Because we do love to quote Jeremiah. And well we should. The writer of Hebrews thought well enough of him to quote. So I guess I should. But I want to tell you what Jeremiah... By the way... Jeremiah was over there in Babylon. Uh, excuse me, Ezekiel was over there in Babylon. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem. Ezekiel's over there with the slave. He's a prisoner of war, if you please. We'll have to ask some of these Bible scholars what the difference in his prophecy that I'm just about to read to you and Jeremiah's was, but they are the same thing in different words. Listen to these words. Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, 25th verse. 
Then, oh, by the way, he is talking about the same situation that Jeremiah was talking about, Jeremiah 31. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all of your filthiness. From all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you. <laughs> so he wasn't putting it in the same old heart. The new covenant is put in a new heart. Alright. A new heart will I also give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart. The one that is continuously evil. I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you shall keep my judgments and do them and you shall dwell in the land give to your fathers. I'll be... You shall be my people. I'll be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanliness. Oh, Jeremiah kept this off. Says, "I will, for I will forgive your sins." Here is, I will save you from all your uncleanliness. Now that's essential. Jeremiah's take on the new covenant. This is very interesting. We no longer have Ten Commandments on the tables of stone. But those words inside us. But more than words inside us, on a new heart. But more than just on a new heart, a spirit. And where the spirit is, there's life. And where the spirit is, there's energy. God is got into our want-tos. How about that? So it's not God whipping us from the outside and saying, do it or else. It's God inside saying, we can do it. Amen. We will do it. I like that. You know in that old covenant, if you wanted to get closer to God or to know anything more about Him, you usually had to go somewhere. Well, a lot of people think today if you want to worship, you've got to go somewhere. Well, you just put yourself back under the old covenant. Well, anyway, if you want to get close to God, you had to go somewhere to the priest or the prophet. Now, that prophet was a chap. He kind of went around saying, Thus said the Lord. Well, it's a sad day when you want to know something about the Lord. Well, where's Elisha and Elijah when we need him? You know, he's not here. I, I'm ignorant. I don't have the spirit. I've got the old heart. I want to know more. They're not here. Well, I had to go. Well, of course, they were certainly uh, good, but uh, that's, that's a horrible thing when you don't have the prophet with you. But it says here when the new covenant comes, you won't have to have your neighbor say, know the Lord, or some prophet coming by says, this is the mind of God. It says you will know the Lord Amen. from first to last, from least to greatest. By the way, when it says you'll know the Lord there, that's that covenant relationship of a marriage. If it's, it's God is again in that relationship with us. Amen. So now we're constituted as a people of God based on the fact that we have we personally know God. And you're personally known of God. Amen. That's even more important. Amen. Because you have been washed inside. You've been made clean. You've been given a new heart. You've been given an indwelling spirit. You, you don't have to go to God. He has come to you. And now I'm not performing for God. If He's come to me, I'm performing from God. Think about that. Christianity is not performing for God. Christianity is performing from God. Because He indwells us. Amen. Now He only lives where that new heart is. Amen. The writers of the Bible talked about the old heart and 
many different ways. He said, well, it has to be washed. That's what Ezekiel said here. No longer stony, but fleshly. Other writers said it has to be circumcised. Well, Paul, I always like, he just crucified the old heart. It's, it, it's useless. Crucify it. Kill it. And of course, here is the thought of a rebirth. You know, by the way, right after Ezekiel uh, uttered these words in the 36th chapter, you remember what he did in the 37th chapter? God took him on a tour. My wife and I used to like to go on tours. And we always loved a good tour director. God was the tour director that day for Ezekiel in the 37th chapter when he carried him to the valley of dry bones. Mm -hmm. Now you all, we're all familiar with that. A couple of interesting things happened there. He toured him well. Back and forth. Back and forth. And Ezekiel made some observations. He said, boy, these bones are dry. These didn't die yesterday. These are dry bones. Well, good tour directors ask questions. Do you remember what God asked him? Can these bones live? Now, if I'm in Adam, what do you think my answer is going to be? Why? That's a stupid question, God. See, God, God always liked the foolishness of what was preached. He even liked it then. <laughs> yes, sir, he sure did. But Ezekiel wouldn't be caught out on that. He said, God, you know. He said, preach to him. Oh, man. What do you think a man in Adam would think? Preach to a bunch of dry bones. But he said, hear the word of the Lord. That's all bones can do. Hear the word of the Lord. Well, you remember the rest of the story. It created quite a noise. Rattling sound, the bones connecting bone to bone, tendons holding them together, flesh appearing, skin covering them. And now what do we have? The world's greatest mortuary. There they lay. Until the Spirit of God comes, until He gives it the new heart, you still just dead. Amen. The new heart, but the Spirit of God did come. Look, bones need a new heart, but more important than that, and this is the emphasis of Scripture, God needs a heart in which He can place His Word that will produce fruit. And it's not just for you. It's for the glory of God. Amen. His name has been abused enough. Yes. Amen. And says, God says, I'm going to give my spirit and I'm going to give a heart where my word can work and where my name will be glorified. Amen. Amen. I don't blame God for that. And I praise Him for including me in that. Amen. It is for His sake. But as uh, Ezekiel looked out there, we have a twice-born people. You don't have bones unless they've been alive. Yeah. A twice-born people. That reminds me, of course, of that famous conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, how can a man be born again when he is old? Jesus, you got to be born of the water and the Spirit. Or you cannot see the kingdom of God. How can this be? You tell me, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the Jews? And you don't know that? That's a low blow, Jesus. Or he should have known. Yes, 
Now, how could he have known? I thought there's New Testament stuff. Did you ever read Ezekiel? Nicodemus? Where Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel, I will wash them. I will give them my spirit. I'll raise that valley of dry bones. Did you know it was you in the valley of the dry bones? Yes, yes. If you do not know you were there, it's useless. Well, we might make a song out of it, dim bones, dim bones, dim dry bones. Or we can just call it a cute story. But till you know you were in that valley, you're not a part and parcel of what this really is. Yes, Ezekiel is one place that Nicodemus should have known. They're dead in trespasses and sins. Were you and I? They're utterly without hope, powerless to do, powerless to be, but for God. It's always but for God. Mm -hmm. He preached to us there. Amen. He washed us, put His Spirit in us, made us alive again, gave us a new heart. Now, of course, you and I know in our experience that it was Jesus that come to do all of these things. Amen. Came to resurrect us came to give us life by His Spirit, came to put a new heart in us, a new kind of heart in us, came that His law would have a fertile ground in which to develop. No impure heart there. A pure heart. Pure means undiluted. Amen. Amen. It's not mixed with anything else. Now I'm talking to you. This is your life. This is who you are. A person washed. A person with a new heart. That's a miracle. Just as sure as you can read the valley of dry bones and says that had to be a miracle. You, do I believe in miracles? Every time I see a Christian, there's a living testimony. That miracles still happen. Moreover, the power that was in that resurrection of those dry bones, scriptures teach us, is in us. And it causes us to act differently than the heart you had in Adam. Amen. You wouldn't even be here tonight if it wasn't for that. It causes us to act differently. Yep, there is a creation out there still with the old man with a heart of stone. To God, it's just a valley of dry bones. But, we, I'm going to pick up one other Ezekiel, one other spot, Ezekiel the 11th chapter. And I will give them one heart now one translation says, I will give them an undivided heart. That is pure. I will give them a pure heart. And I'll put a new spirit within them and I'll take the stony heart out from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Reason? That they may walk in my statues and keep my ordinances and do them and they shall be my God and I will be their people. So the new man, the new creation, the reborn man, washed clean, God's spirit, a new heart with the law dwelling in them. Here in that new creation, Christ is the head and we are the body. Praise God for his revelation to those prophets and the completion of that revelation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, look at Ephesians, the second chapter. Take a little personal experience in the life of the Apostle Paul as he talked to the Ephesians. You have he quickened. You in the valley of dry bone have he quickened, made alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein 
time passed, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now note that Paul included him in that group. Separated from God means no life, not that they were non-existent. They actually, he said, existed in a fear, sphere of trespasses and sins. They had a ruler, Satan. You know, Satan, uh, John says, the whole world lies in the wicked one. Yeah. Amen. Think Satan is holding us like a baby. He doesn't want to let you loose. No more than a mother wants to drop her child. All were there, including this religious man, Pharisee of Pharisees, Saul of Tarsus. Unfit for God's work. The spirit of darkness, he said, was at work in us. That means uh, our energies are marshaled for Satan and Satan's energies are marshaled for us. The energy in that old man was constantly pushes you away from God with that old heart. It constantly pushes you away or it wouldn't be evil. It causes us to believe a lie before we'd believe the truth. Men love darkness rather than light. Paul in 2 Corinthians says the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. This is the reason Jeremiah said the heart was beyond cure. Satan's energies is using is being used to cloud the mind. Don't ever go to an unbeliever for advice on spiritual matters. Amen. His mind's clouded. If he wanted to tell you the truth, he can't see the truth. It's not necessarily intellectual dishonesty we, we, we sometimes just like to pass it off you know you're just being uh, intellectually dishonest that's not true always Satan is there with an energy we're left with no option we must find a way out of that it is a matter of life and death Paul said now I was there he called it living in the lust of the flesh gratifying the sinful nature that's I call it following the old heart. Now note, Paul was the most religious man, Pharisee of Pharisees. He wasn't talking about sexual sins and base immorality. This lust is just a strong desire to satisfy the flesh. The flesh is my mortality, essentially. He's just trying to satisfy the, his mortality. People are still doing it every day. See, flesh is locked into the material world. It can't inherit the kingdom of God. It's locked into the material world. Amen. Destined to be destroyed. See, what Paul's talking about is seeking meaning of our Adam existence. He, he calls that the lust of the flesh and the uh, lust of the mind. He's just seeking meaning in life, has ever, anybody ever asked, what's the meaning of life? Well, here's some answers that I've heard people give. I want a good marriage. I want to see that the poor are fed. I want to see that all bigotry is abolished. I want to see that we have a good government. I want to see that we have a scriptural church. I want to see that I'm religious as the world counts religion. I don't mean to be ugly, but every one of those can simply be the lust of the flesh. Amen. They can be. I'm not saying that when we get our new heart that many of those things aren't admirable. And I'm not even saying you won't have them. I've been blessed with a good marriage. And I thank God for it. But that is not the meaning of of my existence. And they should not be the meaning of yours first. 
You must first get that new heart, and then these things may or may not come. The celebration of your brain, that's the desires of the mind. The celebration of your body, that's the desires of the flesh, is the problem that Paul's referring to here. Now, there's other meanings of life that degrade from this. <laughs> Solomon told us all about those, you know. I'm going to have something to drink here, and I'm going to have me some women over, and I'm going to have drugs or sex or power or food, all of those things. But Paul sought it in religion. All that man can do to go to God. His conclusion, I'm a child of wrath. Child of wrath. That's scary. Verse 4. Ephesians 2. But God. It's always but God. It's always but God. But for God, you still out there in with the dry bones. Amen. Now I want you to note here what is but God who's rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Quickened us, made us alive, and raised us up to sit together in heavenly places. Note two things here. An initiative was taken to give life, and another initiative was taken in our lives. That's the raising us up together to sit with Him. There's two initiatives. One happened in history. One is happening now. God working in me to will and to do of His good pleasure. Two initiatives. Power involved in both. I keep thinking about Ezekiel must have felt foolish. The message sounded foolish, but that's Paul's uh, the world by wisdom knew not God, so it pleased God through the foolishness of what was preached. It's got to be foolish to the Adam mind and the Adam heart to say God loves a sinner. And God is going to save a sinner. And God is going to send His Son. And He's going to take that place of sin. Yep. That has to be foolish to the Greek mind, to many a mind, that He loved the unlovable that he died for the ungodly. That is the foolishness of preaching. But as he loved me and he came to me and he died on the cross for me, he drew me from the arms of the evil one unto himself. He washed me, he purified me, he sanctified me. He placed his law in a circumcised pure heart. He put that spirit within me that will guide and direct me if that's not confidence, I don't think we can find it. Nor can anything else that you line up give you much confidence because all of that was what God did. Amen. But Amen. God. Amen. So our con when you have lost your confidence, rest assured it is in what you have done. Come and focus on what God has done. Now, Paul got practical. He says, you know, I had to go out and preach this. <laughs> it was going to sound foolish to people. So I did it in fear and trembling. He knew what his audience was going to be like. So therefore, he says, I've just depended on this one thing. The 1 Corinthians 2. The power of the Holy Spirit and the demonstration of that Holy Spirit. I didn't want faith to stand in me or man's wisdom, but in God's power. Now that Holy Spirit has and does demonstrate to us. It yanks the rug out from under our clouded eyes and lets us see clearly. Now here is two things that we see that God was right on. He's never been more right. 
And he'll never be more right than he was on these two things. I needed to be justified. Amen. And he was just when he justified me. Amen. Never I can see that now because I have the new heart. The Adam heart cannot grasp that. Only the Holy Spirit. See, it wasn't me that saw it. It was the Holy Spirit working in me. Amen. Amen. Well, it's easy for me to say, well, when I was 18, I made a decision. I walked down the aisle. I uh, repented. I confessed. I was baptized. I this, I that. That woefully understates yes. the conversion. That woefully understates what God has done for you. Amen. Get the eye out of your conversion. It, the business of the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us. The Holy Spirit's in the convicting business. And in that convicting demonstration, faith arises. In a heart changing, in a heart being washed, that heart could now say, Jesus is Lord. He is my Savior. I'll give Him my life because He gave me His. Amen. Thus Jesus comes and breathes into us resurrection power. Now I'm free from having to perform for God, but I can perform from God. That's the new creation. The old creation performs for, the new creation performs from. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now there is power in Adam, power of darkness, but there's a greater power that translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. I like those words, some you say transferred us, some say it's translated, but they're all words of power. We're pressed into the kingdom of God. The Spirit is working. He's energetic. There's a battle going on. It's a stout word. I, I think the word that Paul says on the road to Damascus, I was arrested. What's going on here? That's what the Holy Spirit does. It stops us when we can see then clearly. Now the beauty of that translation is it does put me in a new creation. It gives me a new head where the brain is. I'm immediately locked into that. I thought the other day, I have a bad scar here. I got it when I was about 14 years old. Now about six or seven times since then, the biologists tell me that every cell in that scar has been replaced. And yet every time they come there, it's locked into my brain and says, that's a scar. And so they come and just line up perfectly with the scar. Now, we are locked in to our head. We're locked in to what Jesus is. Was He crucified? I'm crucified with Him. Was He buried? I'm buried with Him. Was He resurrected? I'm resurrected with Him. I don't care if I just come yesterday or 80 years ago. Yes. Or 1900 years ago. Is He raised up to sit in the heavenly places? Paul says you were raised up to sit. Locked in this beautiful history of Jesus. What history of Jesus do you like? The, I love that one. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm locked into that history. I'm not saying this of anything that I've done. You obviously know. When I'm raised with Him, I function in His dimension. I died at the cross, died to Adam, died to the world, died to Babylon, died to sin, died to the law of sin and death, died to those holy mountains, died to ritualistic religion. I'm no more part of this world than Jesus is. Amen. Yep, I got stuck here in a body, but I'm not part of this world. Amen. What does life mean? Consign it to the dunghill, Paul says. Yeah. Mm. Unless you want more graphic language. If you're talking about the life in Adam, it means nothing. If you're talking about the new life in Christ, then Paul says, I, 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 I can't think of enough words to tell you what it is. I'm speechless. 
It means more than everything. Where He is, there we are. Is that confidence? Where He is, we are. That is confidence. Now Paul says, and I'll leave you with this in Ephesians 1.16. See, Paul says, I want to pray some myself. Now, Jeremiah prayed for the clean heart. Now Paul didn't have to pray for the clean heart. He explained it. But now listen to the words that he prayed. Cease not to give thanks for you, make me mention you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He is praying for the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. He's praying that we may know what the hope of this calling is and what the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power. That's where Paul had a hard time finding the right words. To us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ and raised Him from the dead. Now, the eyes of your heart be enlightened. I thought of the birth of the new cats, uh, kittens, and they're blind there for a while, and the kids just are praying that those eyes get open. That's what God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that's their work in us. That's what Paul was praying. I want you with this new heart to grow up to be big cats. Don't stay blind as to who you are. It's my proposition that the number one problem of the so-called Christian community is they don't realize who they are in Christ. Amen. Amen. He says, uh, that power, oh, catch these words here, and to us, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us? Yes. That power was given to us. Yes. That power was the power that God had to exert when He raised Jesus from the dead. Now whatever that was is for us. Amen. Now that certainly is energy in action. The brother this morning coping with faith wanted some energy there. There it is. The energy in action. The strength of God that prevails and conquers all. The mightiness, God's inherent power. Do you know who you are? There it is. It's available for you. Certainly you know it justifies you, but it unbends you to bring you into the image of His head. That, of course, is sanctification. Now, Jesus lived in that realm Himself. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, you, just to touch Him, there's a virtue went out. That, that's the power I'm talking about. It, he, he, he was surrounded with it. He emitted it. We can have that. Now, as our head received the Holy Spirit, so all His cells, that's us, will receive it also opens a whole new world of new covenant living. Confident reactions. We've been invaded with God's power into all of our life. Confidently, we can go forth. So the poets put it this way. This, I say first, this is your life. Though an army besiege me, my heart won't fear the war break out against me, even then will I be confident because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Amen. Whom shall I fear? Amen. Again, my flesh and my heart may fail. Later revelation said they will fail. But God is the strength of my heart. Amen. Amen. Because it's a pure heart. And my portion forever. 
This is your life. I will put my law in your mind. Cause you to walk in my ways. I will wash you clean. I will give you a new heart. Undiluted, pure heart. My spirit will direct your ways. Go live it in confidence.